Hey guys, welcome back to the next section. Um, we're gonna keep exploring a little bit of these, these uh, steel underpinning systems, the push piers and the helical piers, because um, there's two big things that you, you have to know about the design phase of these types of piers. Okay, and um, I'm just gonna jump into it right away. D, Ip, D, Ziggin, design. So, um, if I have a floor plan of the house, Maybe you've seen something like this looking at an apartment. Uh, maybe we'll do a video later on how to make a floor plan. But if you're looking at a floor plan of a house, maybe you got a garage down here, okay? And you've done zip level measurements, which in a different video we're talking about zip levels and stuff. So I know that the house from here to here, we'll call it 15 feet and 19 feet. Uh, we know that this section of the home has been affected by settlement and needs to be supported. Okay, and we decide to use piers um, or some form of steel underpinning. Um, first things first, two feet off the corner, two feet off the corner, you'll get your first pier, and two feet off the corner, you get your other pier. So this is called wrapping the corner, okay? so. Two feet from the corner is where you set your first pier down. You do it on both sides of the corner in order to support that. And then based on the structure, it could be um, the fact that it's a wood frame structure with uh, you know stucco siding. It could just be wood frame wood siding, which is very, very lightweight. Uh, it could be a brick structure, which is very heavy. It could be one story, two story, so on and so forth. The footing though, uh, in a one story, two story, could be so massive that it would support a significant spread load, right? So what am I talking about? Spread load and so on and so forth. So everywhere that I put one of these piers, right? So I'm gonna look at the side of the house now. So now if I'm looking at the side of the house, and I've got my footing here, Right, we've got three piers. One, two, three. Each one of these piers pushes up at a single spot, okay? Right here. That's called a point load. So if I were to draw another line here and say that I put a pier here, this is where the load would be the greatest on the footing, right? And then the load disperses or gets smaller as you go further away from that point that you're pushing up, right? So that, that's your point loading. Each pier individually does this. So assuming the footing can support the spanning capacity of the piers, which is engineering stuff you don't have to worry about, the engineer is designing the spacing of the piers so that each one of these point loads, whether this is five feet or nine feet, like, I don't know, right? It depends on all the conditions, but it's so that the spanning capacity of the piers where this one pushes up, it maxes out here, so this one is also gonna max up here, and this one is also gonna max up here, so now the support that I have on the footing looks more like that, right? And this line here across the center is way higher up than when it gets dispersed down lower, okay? And that also, this is also measuring out like uh, creating too much of a moment and cracking your footing and other stuff like this. So this is called a spread load. Okay, so the design of the piers is to spread the load on the home, to spread the load on the home in order to successfully achieve lifting as well as prevent cracking of the footing or any interior uh, cosmetic stuff and things like that. So what is the average spacing for most? So everyone's gonna change this, okay? And this is one of the very important parts about talking to foundation repair contractors is checking how many numbers of, or how many peers they're trying to put on a house. Because it sounds great if uh, one guy comes out and says, hey, I'm gonna have to put 15 peers on this house. And I go out and I go, uh, you know, I could probably do it with 10. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know how many of these guys are actually trained in engineering. Obviously with experience, uh, a lot of guys will be able to sort of eyeball what they think the engineer is gonna be able to call out. But most people will average out a five foot span 
appears for estimating purposes. Uh, I've seen some companies do six feet. Be wary, but I've seen companies do seven feet. Okay, not very often you get a seven foot spread on footings. I mean, that's starting to happen a little more often, but ultimately it depends on the engineer and what the house is going to be able to sustain, right? So this spacing will change. And if I have a 15 foot spread and I have five foot spacing, right? That's three piers, 15 divided by five is three piers. And I can start building my estimate based off of that. And that's why most people will give you an estimate. But if the engineer comes back and says, hey, uh, you know, you can do this on a seven foot spread. I mean, 15 divided by two piers. If I can do it for two piers instead of three, save myself 2000 bucks, right? So there's a lot of cost savings in the design and what they call value engineering and things like this. But be weary for people who are estimating and pretending that they understand all of this before they've had a structural engineer or anybody who has an authority take a look at something like that. Very, very easily comes back and bites you in the butt sometimes. Um, next thing about the design, I don't wanna to go too far into it for you guys, but the other thing about the design is that, um, if you imagine that footing we were talking about, right? And this is down, let's say, two inches. And then we, we dig out, so this big operation, right? Because you have to dig all the way to the bottom of the footing, usually about 10 to 12 inches below the footing, right? They dig all this out and they chop this off and then they put this bracket on and then they drive this pier and then they pick this thing up and it creates an upward force and it lifts it two inches into the air. What happens with that two inches underneath this slab if all this goes up? This means where the dirt was once supporting it, the dirt, uh, this goes up two inches, so now you have roughly a two inch void underneath the structure. Now, this is where you hit a little bit of a decision making time. Do you want good engineering? Do you want code compliant engineering? Or do you want something that works, right? So most good engineers are gonna run the structural calculations and their design here, all this design, is going to be standalone, which means they can put the piers under the house, they can lift it up to as level as practicable, and they can call it. They can just throw dirt back in and call it a day, right? Now, this is a problem particularly in the state of California. Even though that is the design, the numbers work, and honestly, the installation would probably work too. If you don't do something to fill this void, most California building departments are going to ask you to fill the void with something. Oftentimes they want a cementitious grout, but if you uh, already re reviewed the videos about the compaction grouting, you use polyurethane foam, cementitious grout, cement sand slurry, so on and so forth, right? The other important reason, not just structurally for the slab on the inside here, um, that you want to support all of this is that when you lift all of this up, you create something called a soft story. This is what all of your crawl space posts are. And if anybody who's heard about soft story retrofits through the entire state of California, um, anybody who sold their home and had a foundation inspection and had their crawl space looked at is familiar with soft story retrofits. Uh, it's basically bracing and bolting the entire underside of a house in order to make sure that everything is properly secured, tied into the soil, tied into the structure, and so on and so forth. Big thing for earthquake uh, resilience, or seismic resilience, and, uh, and all that fun jazz. So you're creating a soft story by picking the house up on point loads, right? The spread load picks a house up and it leaves that void underneath. So you wanna come back and fill that void with something via compaction grouting and what you end up doing is returning the soil support to the structure. Um, and by returning that soil load, you can argue with the building department that you are neither in inhibiting nor uh, strengthening <clears throat> the seismic resilience of the structure. So that's just what works. Don't fill the void. Like a lot of good engineers will have the calcs and again, everything that, that could work just fine. Um, 
value engineering and sort of what's going to be code compliant, a little bit different. You want to make sure that void gets filled before they come in and, and do their backfill and all of that fun jazz.